My name is Uhuru Mufukeng and welcome to the South African Book Review Sessions, your online political book club, where everything political literature is dissected, eviscerated, and vivisected. When we started this channel, we promised to review a book a day. We have done so without fail. Please click on the subscribe button at the bottom of your screen and it comes at no extra cost. That will assist you to keep in touch with me and that you may not miss out on any review of your favorite books. What are we discussing today? Today we're discussing our eighth book, a book by Fred Bridgeland titled Quito Quanavale. The book from its cover, you can tell it's a book about war, it's a book about soldiers, it's a book about battles. But above that, this is a book about geopolitics. There are three strategic geopolitical issues the book touches upon. The book touches upon the issues of the Cold War. It tells you, it gets deeper into the parties, the participants, the enemies of the Cold War and their allies. It tells you deep onto the attitudes and the administrations of, of the United States of America and the Soviet Union towards uh, third world countries. It tells you of how the third world countries themselves were impacted by the Cold War. And it, 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 it tells you on, on the various administrations, the attitudes towards the foreign policies. For example, how Gorbachev got to power and change the, uh, the foreign policy as far as countries like Mozambique and Angola were concerned. This book talks about that and talks about it into detail. Secondly, the book talks about the pre-negotiation talks in South Africa, whereby senior intelligence officers, cabinet ministers, and senior members of the National Party, Afrikaner Apartheid government, went and negotiated with Nelson Mandela, met him, and actually prepared the way for the subsequent negotiations. The book talks about that in great length. Last, a third issue, it talks about it as far as geopolitics is concerned. It talks about how South Africa occupied Namibia and how subsequently, after the Battle of Kwato Kwanavalu, South Africa were forced to withdraw from Namibia. It's a very interesting book on those geopolitical issues. It completes the book. It makes it a very interesting book. It, it doesn't make it just a book about guns and battles and bloodshed and so forth, but it makes it a complete read. Now, getting into the crust of the, or crust of the book, the book in its essence, it's a book about war. It's a book about battle. It is a book about conflict. Now, if you want to understand the conflict uh, with the Battle of Quito Quanavalu, you need to understand the, the Angolan civil war. You need to understand basically the, the withdrawal from Angola by the Portuguese. And partly, this book gives you a glimpse into that. It guides you, it guides you into those processes. When you had no idea of those happenings and you read this book, at least it will give you a bit of light what in what led to what and who is who and eventually what happened so as far as that it introduces us the book it starts by by telling us about the withdrawal of portugal it says when portugal decided that listen we are going to withdraw and we'll hand you back your country you can do back independence and you independence we will see what to do that's where the crisis started because the, then arose factions within the populace of angola one organization the mpla and on the other side there was another organization unita now the difference between this organization was political orientation and political outlook the MPLA were Leninist Marxist. They were leaning very closely to Moscow and they enjoyed the patronage of Moscow and they enjoyed the support of Havana. On the other side, UNITA, 
it started off as a Maoist organization, but eventually find themselves as handmade and seen comforts of right wing racist governments across the world. For example, the UNITA was for many, at many a times, even the Battle of Kwato Valley, when South Africa got involved, it was to defend. It was to defend UNITA. It was to defend UNITA. Now this book will guide you into the conflicts between the military wing of UNITA and the military wing of MPNA. Those unitary wings, the FAPLA and the FNLA. That's another thing about this book. Expect a lot of abbreviations. So between FAPLA, the military wing of the MPLA, which was Leninist Marxist in its outlook, and versus the FNLA, which was the military wing of UNITA, which became rather right wing because of the support it was receiving from right wing racist government. The story is told that eventually MPLA and FAPLA managed with the assistance of the Cubans and the Soviets at the Soviets between 1975 and 1980s to drive away Jonas Savimbi, the leader of the UNITA, which had its military wing as the FNLA. Now, in 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 in, in driving away Jonas Savimbi, Savimbi managed to mobilize some of his forces and embark on a very long march to the fields and establish themselves there. Started survivals and 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 and, and managed to actually build an HQ for his um, for his UNITA organization and the FNLA from the forest somewhere in Mavingu, a place called Chamba. Now, that is the story. In, in, in doing so, eventually the forces of, of FAPLA were annoyed that this man still cannot get annihilated. They wanted to finish with Safimbi. So they managed to decide, they decided with the Cubans and the Soviets that listen, we're going to launch one big offensive, just one final one. We need to destroy Savimbi, capture Savimbi, execute him. We need to do that. We're going straight to Mabdingu. Ah, then the intelligence of the South African Defense Force, Sadaf, picked that up. And because it still had presence in, in Angola, as a remnant from the 1975-1977 detachment, which caused a number of stay within the country. They were there up until an expose by the Washington Post and Reuters exposed that South African, uh, the South African Defense Forces fighting within Angola without the South African cities in the knowing. There was a big, big international outlash. They withdrew, but very slowly. But in the process of doing so, Intelligence picked up that you know what, uh, Farplay is going for one offensive, and it's a huge offensive. They want to finish off Savimbi, and it was in the interest of the South Africans that Savimbi should not be finished. That Unita and, and, and FNLA should continue fighting what they consider enemies in the Leninist, Marxist, uh, orientated MPNA and Farplay forces. Now. That the, that big offensive, which had about a, a number of brigades, they tell us there was a 15th, 16th, 25th, 47th, and 59th brigade of FAPLA. These were huge, uh, huge brigades. So this was a big onslaught. They were all moving towards the direction of Mavingu to make sure they, uh, they finish for good with Jonas Savimbi and his unit. South Africa then went and intervened and in the town of Quito Quanavalo ensued a big battle which lasted for years and up until uh, the parties involved went and sat into the negotiation table. The outcomes of the battles of Ang uh, the, of the war of Angola and the bet and the number of battles, especially the Battle of Quito Quanavalo was actually the 
negotiation table. The negotiation, the parties were forced into the negotiation table because of the losses, because of the expenses of, of actually continuing the war and the various battles that were taking place. So they were forced into the table. Now, the table benefited most. It benefited South Africa because South Africa, when it got to the negotiating table, they had the upper hand of the following. It knew that it had it could rest on its laurels that there would be no communist backed or soviet backed revolution that would take place in south africa with the help of the cubans because had the forces of fabla the cubans soviets and the mpla generally managed to execute savimbi early on in the early in the mid 80s Definitely, they were going to march with Swapo down to the uh, to, to 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 Namibia and to push for the liberation of Namibia. And once that is achieved, the next stop that they were coming for was South Africa, as they had promised from the from 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 from, from Moscow and Havana that they would come a socialist revolution that would push South Africa up until the tip of Saldana Bay. So that made them very uncomfortable. And the thought of a Soviet backed uh, revolution. But then after the the Kwaito Kwaito Valley battle, that possibility seemed very unlikely. Because the throwing table, these were the conditions of the throwing table. That South Africa must withdraw from Angola. South Africa must withdraw from Namibia. But not just that. While South Africa withdraws from these countries, the Cubans must withdraw from Namibia. And the Angolans must expel the African National Congress from and, and Swapo within Angola. And that, and, and that happened. That basically happened like that. Ango, uh, 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 Angola uh, uh, did expel the ANC and Swapo, but Swapo and, and Namibia managed to gain their independence back. Uh, South Africa went to the negotiation table with the African National Congress while knowing very well that the South Af the African National Congress was not in a position of, of waging any war because the Soviets and the Cubans had actually exhausted themselves. And besides, by that time, in 1990, uh, that the... the Gorbachev had, had collapsed the world. So it is an interesting book. It, it tells you about the geopolitics before the war. It tells you about the war itself. It tells you about the attacks. It tells you about the sort of weaponry and so forth. But then there's a big law to this book, a fundamental law. The author is rather partisan. The author is British. So he's rather much more lenient to the Americans and their Western allies. For example, as far as funding is concerned, he claims that Soviet Union, Moscow, contributed $400 billion worth of us. Like, like that, like $400 billion. That's a lot of money, man. No, that's too, it's exaggerating. No, it's exaggerating. No, 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 no. That's a lot of money. He would, the note government would actually donate money for, for you know. Yes, they did donate money. And from what we can pick up, it was only $4 billion. But same thing, same thing. The Americans, the Americans and the Western governments roughly spent the same amount of money. Or, uh, roughly spent the same amount of money as far as, as supplying UNITA, Savimbi, and its FNLA. But then with, that excludes the cost uh, uh, by, by, uh, uh, accumulated by the South Africans. But if you were to join, that's a big cost all in a war just to stop an ideology that people should share. Now, I feel like the author is also rather quite hostile and antagonistic towards the left and the left and axis of the global politics. By that I mean, is very 
hostile to Marxist Leninists, he's hostile to communists. He does not like communism at all and he does not hide it. He makes you feel like he does not like it. He undermines everything Soviet, anything communist. For example, he talks in detail about about the types of weaponry used within the battles in Kweto Kwano Valley. Talks about the T-55 tanks, talks about the T-35 tanks, talks about the same, uh, the same eight, same nine missiles, tells you about the Chokarev pistol, tells you about the Makarov pistols, tells you about the AK-47, tells you about a lot of Soviet um, weaponry, but then, when he talks of the South African weaponry, he paints the picture that the South African weaponry was far superior. He painted the picture that the T-55 tanks were nothing compared to the rattles. And as a former member of the South African National Defense Force myself, that is rather a bit absurd. But anyway, this man does that and he glorifies the military prowess and the tactical astute astuteness of the commanders and, and the soldiers of the South African army. And, but eventually, in conclusion, he, he wants us to believe that he is not, he believes that the war was rather a, a, a stalemate. But then he presents the figures of the death toll as humongous in the side of the Angolans, meaning the MPLA, FAPLA, Cubans and the Soviet alliance, while it makes it seem like only an iota, a Ludupitan number suffered casualties or actually died. It's only, a, it mentions a handful of number of deaths suffered and casualties suffered by the South African National Defense Force, a South African Defense Force, SADAF, not that, that SADAF within a period of 1985 and 1988. And because of that, the partisanship and the antagonisms towards the left and other issues, and, 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 and basically the, the anxious nature of, to uh, the anxious writings or the anxious character of of his writing towards the South Africans is rather a disturbing feat. No, I, no, no, it's too much praise singing for the Af for South African weaponry, South African infantry, South African tactical astuteness. No, that, that is too much. And besides, to show that this person is partisan, he, the interviews he did for this book were mainly from the South African. This book is told from a South African perspective. The battles are told from a South African Afrikaner perspective. Um, you, he tells you about their commanders, their, their troops, their sappers, their com lieutenants, officers, non-commissioned officers. But then he will not tell you the same with, with, with FAPLA. We don't know who commanded FAPLA. We don't know their backgrounds. We do not know anything. But he, we know so much about the South African Defense Force. And it's unfortunate because they should have just titled this book Quito Kwana Valley from the eyes of the South African Defense Force. And because of that, from 0 to 10, how do I rate this book? I rate it a 5.